Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne of grace to thank you for this day, Lord, to thank you for this time that we're able to open up your word. Please clear our minds and our thoughts and our hearts, Lord, and help us to receive the word gladly. Lord, but help, help us to also receive it humbly, realizing, Lord, there is always more for us to grow, always more for us to do, Lord, not out of obligation, but because of all that you've done for us. Help as I preach this morning, Lord, and as I speak, let it not be my words, but your words spoken through me. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever been asked a question where it almost seems like it's a, there's an easy answer, but when you think about it, the answer is always not as easy as, as what you first anticipate? It's kind of like, you know, someone asked me, do you believe in God? Well, yeah. Yeah, I believe. Well, then you start thinking about belief, right? You really, you know, that's what I do. When I, whenever someone asks me, I, I overanalyze, right? I over, like, you know, I, cri I critically try to think about all the different possibilities. And what does it really mean to believe? Do you mean that, like, if I said I confess Jesus as, as the Christ? Yeah, I believe that. I believe that God created all things and that we were not here by accident, Right, And we're not just, you know, uh, uh, out of a, a, an ooze popped up out of life and all things that exist now exist from nothing. No, I don't believe that. I believe there was a creator. I believe that God sustains the world with his word. And the day that he wants to shut it all down, he can shut it down. I believe that. And then I think about a verse like, even the demons believed. Right? Okay, the demons Right? When Jesus was walking in his ministry, he'd walk around and, and they'd go, You, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, what do you have to do with us? Right? Leave us alone. We know who you are. And I think, is it, is it knowing that God is real? Is that enough? Is that, is that what people are asking when they say, Do you believe? And I've, I've done some study on this word, um, and there's a book that I really have really kind of cling to. And it takes the idea of the word pistos, which is belief and faith, um, and it really comes back to the word allegiance or trust or loyalty the Old Testament would use. And so when you put it like that, do you fully trust in God? Well, what do you mean by that? Like when you're going through your everyday life and things go wrong, do you believe that God is with you? Do you believe that God cares for you? Do you believe that God is going to see you through? And then I go back and go, oh, I don't know if I always, right? I kind of feel like the apostles when they were asking about forgiveness, Lord, help our unbelief. They believe, obviously, they're following Jesus, but there was still an element of unbelief. So we can believe and not believe at the same time, can't we? We can believe the facts about God and about Jesus and that this is the word of God. I believe that wholeheartedly. But do I always trust it? Do I always live it? Is it, is it the thing that guides my every decision and action in life? Not always. And so is there an element of unbelief in our lives when we are not fully trusting in God? I think so. And I don't know if you were, not everybody was there, but I did a study of John uh, a, a couple years ago during the, that sickness that everybody got, right? That, uh, that thing that shall not be named going on. Um, but one of the things I discovered as I was reading through that book is we call it the gospel of belief, and I believe that. But there's almost more unbelief in the book of John than there is belief, and these are people who are believers in Jesus. They're coming to Jesus. And yet they're constantly wrought with unbelief. And so I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. And starting off in our, in our scripture that was read for us this morning, go to John chapter 2. This is a statement that I, you know, it's one of those statements you read over and you don't, you've got to like stop and process like what, what was just said, right? Um, let's read it. So this is after Jesus cleanses the temple. He performs his first sign that John has at the wedding of Cana. And he's performing many miracles, okay? 
And look at verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw signs that he was doing. And it would be great if the verse ended right there. Many believed. They saw signs and they believed. And once again, why is John writing this book? I write these things so that you may believe. These are the signs that Jesus performed so that you may believe. And they're seeing signs, people who were living and walking and seeing Jesus, and they believe. But look at the next verse. But when Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Just think about that. Sit with that for a moment. These are people who are coming to believe in Jesus, and Jesus says, I don't trust myself with you. I will not entrust myself to you because he knows all people. I mean, if you just jump to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, does that not pan out? People who believe, people who when Jesus was riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, what were they singing? Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. And in the next breath... The next chapter over, what are they shouting? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. People who welcome Jesus into the town are the very people who put Jesus on the cross. And Peter emphasizes that in his sermon in Acts 2, doesn't he? It was you who crucified our Lord. You said crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You put our Lord on the cross. And so there's some legitimacy to Jesus' claim, right? There are believers, people who see the signs of Jesus, and yet Jesus says there's still something missing in their faith and in their belief that I I wouldn't entrust myself to them. And just on a practical level, have there ever been Christians who you would not entrust yourself to? You would not leave in the hands of your kids? Because we're imperfect, aren't we? Right? We're imperfect. And not everybody who claims to be Christian, not everybody claims to be a believer in God, acts and behaves in such ways, do they? You, you've probably been around people long enough where you, you realize there are people who, are, who wear the name, right? wear the tag, it's on their Facebook page. right? I like, to, I like to point out Facebook, I'm sorry. But everything else in their life just doesn't seem to add up. It doesn't seem to match. But I, this statement... Jesus knows what is in man. That statement always, and I bring this up often, it scares me. The fact that Jesus knows everything about me. He knows I can get up here and fool all of you that I'm this great man of faith, can I? And how many preachers have done that, right? Have been able to proclaim the word of God, and then something happens in life, you kind of go, really? Right? Preachers are human, aren't they? Just people. Right? I know I'm elevated a little bit, but I wish I was down there. Right? I remember the first time being here, I almost fell off this thing. That's why you guys hired me. You just wanted to see it. It Hasn't happened in eight years yet. I know. Right? But so that's what Jesus says. He would not entrust himself because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what is in man. And that plays out in John chapter 3, right? Oh, and this is the wrong PowerPoint. I already see it's already wrong. I added some stuff, so we're going to have to go with it. Um, John chapter 3, the very next ver- the very next chapter, Nicodemus, a teacher of law, comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, we know that you are what? From God. For nobody could perform the signs in the miracles that you are performing without being from God. And yet, at the end of the discussion, Nicodemus is questioning Jesus, and Jesus finally goes, are you not a teacher of the law, and yet you don't understand, the ESV says, heavenly things? When I tried to explain heavenly things to you, we would use the word spiritual. 
And how many Christians, how many of us, get so caught up in the physicality of things, in the physical nature of Christianity, and especially when it comes to worship, right? We have a lot of discussions on what we look like and the physical nature of how we come into this building, yet many of us forget what really matters. It's the spiritual. What, how are you, are you clothed in Christ? Are you clothed in righteousness? Are you clothed in sanctification? Do you have Jesus' words and life in you and living out of you? I don't care what you look like when you walk in the building. I care how you act. Right? I care what's on the inside. And that will reflect, right? The outside hopefully will reflect that. Right? But still, we sometimes can get so... I'll bring another example. Election's about to happen, right? Election's about to happen, and, and a lot of times we get very focused on it, okay? But do you realize there are two kingdoms going on right now in the world? There's the physical kingdom, and then there is the heavenly kingdom. And sometimes we, we conflate the two as if they, one controls the other. Now, I will say one controls the other. The spiritual one controls the physical one. Jesus is sitting on the throne above all rule, power, and authority, is he not? And sometimes we act as if the physical one has control over the spiritual one. As if we, if we can fix the physical kingdom that's going on, we will somehow better and benefit the spiritual. It's the opposite. You want to fix the physical kingdom, get involved in the spiritual one. Be, I'm not saying that you have to completely separate yourself from the two, right? But we can't put the cart before the horse. And sometimes we focus on the physical things that we can... Because it's easy. We're human, aren't we? We can see the physical things. These are things that we can, we can tangibly touch and see. Jesus is something we can't tangibly touch and see. And yet he's more real than anything we can see. Is he not? And that's what Jesus' focus on was, blessed are you who believe and yet do not see, right? And so sometimes we can get a little, just like this, this guy's a teacher of the law, he knew his law. But what did the Jews constantly get focused on? When are you going to establish your kingdom? Well, what did they mean by that? I want a throne in Jerusalem where you're sitting and you're killing all of the enemies. That's what they wanted. Jesus goes, my kingdom's not like that. He even tell Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. This current world, the way it's... Eh, you wouldn't want a kingdom coming out of this. You wouldn't want a kingdom that is born out of what's going on in the physical nature of the kingdom. You want something better, transcendent from God. And that's what I offer, okay? So sometimes we can get focused on that. A lot of times we work for food that perishes. John chapter 6, remember after he feeds the 5,000? And um, they come back. And when Jesus is watching them approach, there's something about their approach, maybe the conversations that are going on. And Jesus, obviously, he knows what's what. He knows what's in man. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows what's in our thoughts, right? Because wouldn't we be amazed if we could get 5,000 people to come out to hear a message about Jesus? Right? Imagine we put flyers in the newspaper. You know, we went and door knocked and left hangers on everybody's door. And we told them that, you know, we're going to provide free meals for you, prayer for you, come and hear a message about Jesus. And 5,000 people came out. We'd be just blown away, wouldn't we? And Jesus sees the 5,000 go, nah, -uh. no, I don't believe it. All right? Look at John 6 with me. Look what he says. <clears throat> you know, Jesus is always counter to the way we would operate. Because I'm going to tell you, if we got 5,000 people out there, okay, how can we keep them? All right? How can we, you know, what are we going to say to make sure they're not getting upset? Right? To make sure they're not going to, you know, understand the wrong thing. At least they're here. At least they're here. Jesus doesn't always have the at least they're here attitude. Okay? If they're there for the wrong reason, if they're for the right reasons, Jesus is like, I'm glad you're here. Come, right? All you who are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest, right? But in John chapter 6, verse 26, look what he says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, 
not because you saw signs. So they're not even coming for the signs. You're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And he'll go down to say, this is the work of God, that you believe in him. Verse 29, believe in him who has sent. The work of God is to believe in Jesus. And how often do we spend so much of our time and effort working for things that don't matter? Putting our hands to things that don't matter, putting our time and energy to things that don't matter, they will be burned up. They will be gone. When we die, we can't take them with us, but we can take our faith. We will take our faith. We will take our love. We will take our relationship with Christ. And I think sometimes, you know, we get so focused on us. What can Jesus do for me? Right? They're coming to Jesus so Jesus can fill their bellies. And Jesus is going, but what are you offering Right? Isaiah did not say, you know, when God was looking for a man to go out, hey, God, um, I I need some stuff too. Right? Imagine Isaiah, there's there's some things that I need. You're the God of creation, right? You can do all things, you can answer all prayers. Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. I need a man to go. Here am I, send me. You're going to get hurt, you're going to get mocked, you're going to get ridiculed, and this will be your death. Isaiah goes, you know what? It's not looking good for me, but it's looking good for God. I'll go. And that's sometimes what we're lacking, isn't it? We're seeking what can the church offer me, right? Uh, you know, there's that statement, not don't ask what can my country do for me, but what can I do for my country? Same thing in the kingdom of God. Don't ask what can God do for me, He's already done. He's already done it for you. Jesus has already come and died for you. He's offered you forgiveness. He's offered you a place in his kingdom. He's offered you peace and love. And he he says, I will never leave you. He's already given. It's already available. Once you're in Christ, every spiritual blessing is found where? In Christ, in the heavenly. You already have it. Now, what can you do for him? Right? And so... But we're always needing more signs. John chapter 4, right? The uh, official son comes out. Can you heal my son? And Jesus makes this statement. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. All right? And so, and Daniel brought this up a couple weeks ago. Great sermon on that. The fact that, you know, everyone's always looking for a sign. Everyone's always looking for a miracle. If I could just, if I could personally experience a miracle then I would believe. And Jesus says the incessant need for miracles will be your downfall because you'll always want one more and you'll always want one better. And you'll always think, well, they got that. And you're right. When he went to his hometown, hey, you're performing all these miracles for everybody else. You're not doing it for me. Right. And it becomes about we're wanting a dog and pony show. Right. We're just wanting to see something great and miraculous. It's funny we're always needing more signs, and yet we reject clear signs. Right, John chapter 11. Remember in John 11, he rose Lazarus from the dead? And when he rose Lazarus from the dead, what did people do? We got to quiet this down. Right? We got to get people to stop talking about this. Why? Because they might believe. The Pharisees were ones who were asking for signs, weren't they? Jesus says, you wicked generation, right? If Sodom and Gomorrah saw what you saw, they would, they would repent, right? He goes to the extreme, and yet they, he gives them a clear sign. A man was dead for four days in the ground, and they did not believe. John chapter 20, verse 29, right? Blessed are you who believe and do not see. God is looking for something greater. He's not looking for you to have every single one of your doubts verified. Every single shadow of, you know what, mate, God just, I mean, because you would never be satisfied. I'm telling you, you would never be satisfied. There's not a miracle that God could do that he's not already done that would satisfy you. He already raised people from the dead. But I didn't see it. Do you really got to see something to believe it? Right? How, how childish is it 
to only believe in things that you've seen. All right? How many of you read a history book? Do you, do you believe it? Well, I wasn't there. Okay, I mean, there's a level in which you're right. You've got to take someone else's word for it. But is it attested by? Is it verified? Are there other people who wrote about it, right? The, the historical facts around the Word of God cannot, I mean, they can be denied because they're denied every day, but, right? But there's enough proof that if you want to believe, it's there. And there's enough doubt that if you don't want to believe, you won't. Even if God came directly down out of heaven and walked among with you and said, I am the Son of God. Don't think that that would change people's mind who don't want it because he did that and he proved who he was and they still did not believe. We reject clear signs, even in our own lives, right? God will answer a prayer and we, one moment we're thanking him. Thank God, thank you for answering a prayer. And then the next thing happens. God, where are you? Right, you just acknowledged you just acknowledged and gave thanks and gratitude to him. And now the next thing, and he hasn't answered it on your time frame, and he hasn't done it the way you want it to be done, and all of a sudden you're down in the valley again. Well, then he answers, and you're up, right? It's like Israel. Voom, voom, right? We're up and down, up and down. Why don't we have a faith that is consistent, or maybe that is actually growing? where we don't need a miracle and a sign every time to make us feel good about our faith and to verify our faith, that we, it's been verified, it's been proven, and we believe based upon what God has said in his word, not because of what we see on a daily basis. Because how many people look out in the world around us, the number one argument against God is, is evil and suffering, isn't it? We see evil and suffering, therefore there must not be a good God. Well, it's already proven Right, that God came to redeem the world. He came to bring light into the world. But men love darkness. God's not going to force people who love darkness to join the light. He's going to give them opportunities. He's going to give them the church. He's going to give them preachers. He's going to have neighbors who are trying to proclaim the message. But if someone wants to do evil and wickedness, why do we blame God for it? It's going to happen. And sin's in the world. God has promised to redeem the world and to recreate all things, right? And so, John chapter 6, let's go there for a moment. John chapter 6, I want to read this section. we got to get beyond a belief that needs to see something. We have to move beyond that. Because a majority of people throughout history will have never seen a sign. They'll have never seen a miracle. We even think, well, look at the Old Testament. Look how many miracles there were. There were not that many miracles, by the way, right? There were time frames where God performed miracles, right, when they were transitioning from one era to the next, but they will go four or five hundred years without ever seeing a miracle from God, okay? And they're still believing, right? They have their historical data and the stories of what their forefathers and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Passover, that's why they kept the Passover was so they could never forget what God done for them. Well, how many Passovers does God have to do before you believe, right? How many Passovers have to happen? How many floods have to happen, right? I don't need another one of those, okay, right? Unless I've got the boat and I'm on it. All right? But I don't need another one of those. How many times does the Son of God have to come down and die? Does he have to do it in every generation? Right? Well, I didn't see Jesus. Well, there's going to be millions of people who don't see Jesus. Our faith has to be more than that. Okay? And so in John 6, after Jesus gets done talking to the 5,000 who are walking away, right? And he says, you need to eat my, eat my body, right? And eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he's not, you know, he's not being real there, but he's, you need to consume all of me. It needs to be all about me. They came to fill their bellies and he's turning the statement says, if it's about you, you will fail. It's all about me. They don't like that. That's hard. They walk away. And he turns to his disciples. Look at verse 60, verse, verse 60 of John 6. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? 
Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. You realize he didn't say the miracles or the signs? The signs just verify who Jesus was. It's his words that bring life. It's his words. And that goes all the way back to the beginning. What bought creation of the world? What allowed creation to be possible? Words. God spoke the world into existence, didn't he? When Jesus forgives sins, it's because he speaks your sins are forgiven is what has power, right? When he tells the man to take up your bed and walk, it's words that have power. And so Jesus says, it is my words that bring life. And now watch. But there are some of you who do not believe. Wait a minute. He came to his disciples. He's speaking to his disciples. And there are those who do not believe. Well, why are they there? And I want to ask you the question this morning. Why are you here? Right? We, all of us can claim to be a disciple and a follower and a Christian. But are there, there, are there those this morning who still don't believe, who don't trust, who don't have faith in? He says, For Jesus knew from the beginning who were those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. We got Judas in the mix. He said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I know who are true believers and who are true unbelievers. At least they were honest. The true unbelievers got up and walked out. They got up and left. At least they were honest about it. They weren't like, well, what's, 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 what's Susie doing? If she leaves, I'll leave. If she stays, I'm staying. No, they got up and left. They recognized they were not committed yet. Doesn't mean they won't be one day, right? The resurrection changes a lot of people's minds. But Jesus said to the 12, this is where I want to get, do you want to go away as well? And Peter does not say, but we see the signs that you've done, you must be from God. Look what he says. Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered him, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the miracles of life. You have the signs of life. You have the words of life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that if they would have known that they were crucifying the Lord and who he was, they wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't have done it. John will, or Jesus will say later in John chapter 5 that you search the scriptures daily and in them you think that you have life. But in them they point to whom? They point to me, even knowing this book is not enough if you don't know the man who it's being written about. Knowing scripture and memorizing scripture does not save you. Knowing Christ saves you. And I know I said at the beginning that Jesus knowing everything that is in us is scary, but it's also greatly comforting. Because remember in Luke 23, when Jesus is on the cross, what does he pray to the Father? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These are the men who said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew they had been peer pressured. He knew that they were conflicted about the message of Jesus that was going around, that he was spreading, and the message the Pharisees were going. And he knew the political pull that this would have had, the tug, the social and economic you know, consequences of believing in Jesus if he's not the real Messiah. Even John the Baptist, before he dies, go, are you the one? Verify one last time for me before I die for my faith. You are the one. Jesus says, go and show them the things that have been done. Right? Those are the verifications of what Jesus, who Jesus was. And Jesus on the cross says, for Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus knows even our deepest secrets, even our most our, our sins that we would never share in public. And yet he still offers forgiveness because he loves us. I am glad 
Jesus knows everything in me and still loves me. One of my most comforting verses in all of Scripture is 1 John chapter 3. It says, even when our own hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Anything that we ask, he will give if we ask in the name of Jesus. This morning, where's your belief at? Where's your trust? I want to ask that question again. Do you believe? We'll ask it another way. Where's your unbelief? What is the Lord and what can the church, what can we do to help your unbelief this morning? Maybe you haven't given your life to Christ yet. Maybe you're on the fence. Maybe you're like, you know what? I don't know. I'm not sure. I want to follow. What do I got to give up? Think about what God gave up. Think of what God has sacrificed. Think of what God has done for you and what he offers. Is there anything worth in your life? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet to lose his soul? Nothing. There's nothing that compares to the riches that are found in Jesus. Why not today? Why not now have your sins washed away in baptism to rise and walk in newness of life? And if you are a Christian, I know we've all got unbelief. I know there's all of us struggle at times where there are things that we wish, right? If you were to say, you know what, this is the kind of Christian I want to be. This is the Christian I desire to be, and here's where I'm at. What's the, what is the bridge? What is stopping you from going to the next level? Let us pray with you. Let us help you. And maybe you're just like, I'm just trying to survive, Jesse. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling with just survival let alone getting to the next step. I just want to get back on the step I used to be. I've gone down steps. Pray, Lord, help my unbelief, and let us be there with you. Let us pray with you. Let us comfort you. Let us encourage you. If there's anything that you need, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and sing.